you, uh, David, for this uh, for this introduction. So it switched on now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good. Right. That works. Um, <coughs> I am going to talk uh, today about uh, one of my main uh, research projects, uh, which is called uh, COMPASS, and COMPASS is short for uh, Computational Astereology. The goal of uh, the COMPASS project is to make uh, data science methods uh, available for astereologists. So the project basically uh, involves uh, a number of tools and example uh, projects that are useful or may be useful or hopefully are useful for um, cuneiform research. Um, before talking more about uh, the COMPASS uh, project, I have to take you back into uh, history for um, a little while. One of the main and most important and most consequential uh, developments in information technology did not take place in Silicon Valley. It took place in the deep south of uh, what is now Iraq, in a city called Uruk, where people started writing at around 3200 uh, BCE. Writing started essentially as uh, an administrative tool. Uh, so the example you see here is an account of a metal object, uh, delivery of a variety of uh, metal objects. But over time, uh, writing was used for uh, a broad variety of things. Uh, let me take you through a very schematic history of uh, cuneiform writing. So it begins primarily with administrative uh, accounts uh, as well as uh, school texts. A few hundred years later, uh, we get royal inscriptions, essentially kings bragging about their uh, achievements. Um, halfway the third millennium, we get the first literary texts in Sumerian, uh, primarily songs. Um, then we get letters uh, for long distance uh, communication. In the early second millennium, uh, we get sort of an explosion of writing. Writing is uh, being used for all kinds of things, uh, including divination, uh, again, literary text, but now in Akkadian, uh, medical text, uh, mathematical text, uh, and all kinds of other things. In the first millennium, uh, then astronomical tables are probably the most important uh, genre that is added uh, to this list. Um, around the year zero, or a little later uh, than that, uh, cuneiform is uh, basically abandoned. It has been replaced by other writing systems. Uh, in particular Greek and Aramaic. Um, <coughs> cuneiform is not a language, it is a writing system, uh, which means that in principle you can write any language in uh, cuneiform. But what we find is primarily texts in Sumerian and texts in Akkadian. Uh, Sumerian is a linguistic isolate. Um, it was probably a spoken language uh, all through the third millennium uh, in the deep south of uh, Mesopotamia. It died out as a spoken language around uh, 2000. Akkadian is a Semitic language, which means that it is uh, related to Arabic and Hebrew and Aramaic and a number of other languages uh, in that group. Um, those are the two main languages uh, that we find in cuneiform. I will be talking uh, today, I will be using concepts like uh, transliteration and lemmatization. Uh, and in order to make clear what that means, uh, I show you here four different representations of the same simple Sumerian sentence. So the first representation is in cuneiform. Uh, the second is a sign-by-sign -sign transliteration of that same sentence. Lugal e e mu undu. The third then is uh, again the same sentence, but now in lemmatization. Uh, Lugal is king and is a noun. A is house, is also a noun. And do is to build and is a verb. As you can see, uh, morphology is uh, omitted in lemmatization. And what is added is a very basic translation uh, of each word. Finally then, a translation uh, in English, uh, the king built the temple. 
want to draw your attention to the word temple uh, here. That is what it means. Uh, the king built a temple. In the lamentization, we have the word house instead of temple. So the word A can mean either house or temple. It's the same thing. A temple is the house uh, of a god. Um, but what is important here is that in lamentization, we only give the most basic translation uh, of that word. About 25 years ago, um, Assyriologists started uh, to collect digital representations of cuneiform text. Um, that whole thing really started uh, with Etzel. You see here the seven most important uh, digital projects uh, listed. Um, this whole thing really started with Etzel. It started in 1996. Um, and Etzel is the electronic text corpus of Sumerian literature. Um, and so from that title, you may guess that they focus on Sumerian and that they focus on the literary corpus. Uh, about 400 uh, literary texts in Sumerian are presented uh, in that project. Um, <coughs> you can see that the project ended. Uh, they ended in 2006. Uh, so what we have today is essentially an archival version uh, of that uh, project. It was a revolutionary project, it was um, ahead of its time, uh, and it was very important for the history of uh, Assyriology uh, afterwards, so for where we are uh, today. As you can see, there are a number of, uh, of other uh, important projects. Uh, they all have their own uh, abbreviation, uh, as you can see there. I will not go uh, through all of them uh, right now, but you can see that there are significant numbers of uh, texts that are represented in those projects. And I will come back to this table uh, at the end of my talk if I have time for that. So that is one very important uh, development, the um, attempt by Assyriologists to create digital representations of our source material. A very different uh, development uh, took place on the side of uh, data science. In the last 10 or 15 years, uh, data science has made enormous progress in making their tools available uh, to a wider population, making their tools available to people who may not define themselves as, say, computer scientists. So if we only look at Berkeley for now, in 2013, um, the data lab uh, was established uh, in the social sciences. In that same year, uh, the Berkeley Institute for Data Science, where we are right now, uh, was established. In 2015, uh, the first installment of Data 8, the introductory course uh, to data science for undergraduates, um, happened. Uh, 2016 to 2018, we had the Berkeley Summer Institute for Digital Humanities, uh, which was very important to me because that's where I f learned my first steps in, uh, in data science. Um, in 2018, I believe it was 2018, uh, the division of data science uh, was established. And um, I know that that division has a different name now, uh, but I cannot remember that, I don't know. Um, and I guess I could add to this list uh, 2025, the new building uh, for data science. Um, I'm not quite sure what the calendar for that is, but let's say 2025. Um, I also have Jupiter uh, in this uh, image. Uh, so Jupiter is on the, on the software side. Uh, <coughs> Jupiter was developed uh, here at Berkeley and uh, here at uh, BITS as a way to make um, scripts in Python or in other language, uh, other scripting languages uh, more accessible uh, to users. So two developments then, one on the archaeological side uh, to digitize uh, their data and the other on the data science side uh, to make data science more accessible. Uh, at the intersection of those two developments there, that is where I want to see COMPASS. That's where I want to see uh, computational archaeology as uh, my project. What is the potential of such a project? What kinds of things can we do um, with the digitized data 
and the tools from data science. One thing that we can do is scaling up. So the things that uh, SEOlogists have been doing anyway, but now doing them on a larger scale. And I have to tell you a little bit now about ancient Babylonian schooling, which actually is one of my uh, specialties. So in the old Babylonian period, uh, when you went to scribal school, uh, one of the things you had to learn was Sumerian. Uh, Sumerian by this time is a dead language. Uh, scribal pupils had to learn Sumerian. And what they did is they would copy long lists of Sumerian words. Um, many of those lists are uh, thematic in organization, so you have a list of trees or a list of uh, pots or a list of stones uh, and so on. After graduating from that, those same pupils would write, would copy and learn uh, Sumerian literary texts. These are hymns to gods and hymns to kings or narratives about Gilgamesh or about uh, other ancient kings uh, and um, mythological texts. And one of the questions uh, that has been asked for quite a while is what is the relationship between the vocabulary in these lexical lists and the vocabulary in the literary texts? So is the vocabulary in the lexical lists only to prepare you uh, for reading uh, literary texts or is there something else to it? Now in a book that I published in 2004 I argued that the list of birds that only one third of the bird names in that list is ever found in the literary material. In other words that those poor kids who were copying all these uh, names for various birds one third of them they would ever see again in their life and the other two thirds they would never encounter again. They would learn them, they would know them by heart, and never see them again. And what it means is uh, that these lexical lists are not only valued as sort of preparation for reading and understanding the literary text, but that they have a value of their own. What that value is, I will not go uh, into it. That is by itself a very interesting story. What is interesting here is that today we can scale up this research and say, well, this is not only about birds, but what if we looked at the entire vocabulary in the lexical text, in the thousands of lexical texts that we have from this period, and the entire vocabulary of uh, the Sumerian literary texts, again, thousands of them uh, from the old Babylonian period. And you can see that you get a sort of similar uh, result in this Venn diagram you can see that there is about one-third of the uh, lexical terminology is found in the literary text as well. What we can also do uh, today is we can zoom in on one particular literary text or one particular uh, <coughs> lexical text and ask where does this overlap take place in particular? Are there literary texts that are more marked by, say, lexical vocabulary vocabulary that you also find in the lexical text, or other literary texts that seem to have a vocabulary that is entirely removed uh, from it. I haven't made that step yet, so I cannot uh, show that uh, to you, uh, but we can do it essentially with the same data set and with the same uh, approach here. So what is the potential of computational SEOlogy? A very different example. Social networks. We can take all the letters that were written to King Sargon. Sargon was a very important and powerful king of the 8th uh, century in Assyria, in uh, northern Mesopotamia. We can take all of the letters that were written to him that we know about uh, today, pull out uh, the proper nouns, and see what kind of network uh, can we build from that. Um, we can pull out all the proper nouns, uh, create a list of nodes and a list of uh, edges, uh, feed that into Gephi, and the visualization that you see here was made uh, in Gephi, and use some of the statistical methods uh, that are available in uh, Gephi to research uh, the structure of that network. Um, you don't see the entire network here, you only see uh, part of it. Um, I was interested in this uh, part because of the green area here where you see a group of people who apparently are very closely um, 
interacting uh, with each other, but their connection to the full network goes primarily through those two guys here. Social network analysis is actually not new uh, to cuneiform studies. It has been done for maybe some 20 years already. Um, but most of the social network analysis studies uh, that I have seen so far work with private data. That is, they work with data that is available on the desktop computer of one or another uh, researcher, and they will show us the graphs and they will show us uh, the results, but they do not give us the data. Um, this is done with publicly available data um, that anybody can pull out and uh, recreate uh, the network that I have created here. Again, then, what is the potential of computational um, assyriology? Again, a very different uh, approach here. Um, a topic model. We can feed all of the data from the uh, state archives of Assyria into a topic model. State archives of Assyria is um, a group of some 3,500 texts uh, from the first millennium from uh, northern Mesopotamia, from Assyria. Um, and what we find in there is a broad variety uh, of texts from letters to the king uh, to administrative texts, uh, transactions, um, ritual texts, uh, all kinds of things. The topic model that I am showing you here has uh, 10 topics, which is probably a little on the low uh, side. Um, and I will show you two different uh, visualizations of this topic model. A topic model is essentially uh, a set of two uh, probability distributions. The first probability distribution is um, the one of words over topics, so which words are important in which topic. And the second uh, probability uh, distribution is one of um, topics over documents, which topic is important in which uh, document. Now for that first uh, probability distribution, ah, that works, that's good. For that first um, probability distribution, the one of words over topics, um, we can use uh, pi LDA vis, which is a ready-made um, module uh, in Python, also available in R, by the way, um, that we can simply uh, set to work and it will produce something like this. So here we have topic three, um, and there we have the important uh, words in uh, topic three, the top 30 most relevant uh, terms. And you see that it starts with shibu, the word for witness, uh, manu, a unit, sarpu, silver, ekru, field, dinu, legal decision. Uh, if you work in cuneiform, things have become clear by now. This is about economic transactions. Right? For any kind of sale, uh, you need witnesses, uh, and so that's why they end up uh, at the very top uh, here. We can also look at uh, topic six here at the bottom, as far away from topic three as we can get. Um, now we get uh, Rabu, Beek, Ilutu, Divinity, Shalmu, Intact, Lu'u, Sulit, Imeru, Shipu, Mouth, and Biru, Divination. At first sight, that may uh, look a little less clear, um, but these are uh, all from the queries to the sun god. The queries to the sun god are questions that the king asks to the sun god, um, like, am I going to war with my brother in Babylonia? Yes or no? Um, and there's a whole process uh, behind that, how the sun god uh, will answer that question. Uh, these texts are quite formulaic. They all begin with uh, some formula that involves your great divinity, and so that's where those first two words uh, come from. So you can see that those topics are very nicely uh, separated uh, in this uh, so-called intertopic uh, distance map. As I said, this is uh, out of the box. Uh, you can uh, simply implement it, and with a little bit of luck, it actually works. Now, let's see how I get back to this. All right. 
For the probability distribution of topics over documents, we do not have an out-of-the-box way of, uh, of looking at that, of visualizing that. Um, I built that in, uh, in Bokeh, and that looks like this. So each dot in this visualization is a document, one of those 3,500 uh, documents. Um, they're colored by topic. Um, they are placed here on this map uh, with MDS um, based on their entire vocabulary, on the entire vocabulary of each uh, document there. Um, we have these two slides uh, on the top, and so we can say, well, give me only topic three and topic six, the same topic that we looked at uh, for the other visualization. And we can see again that these two topics very nicely uh, separate uh, from each other. Um, here we have topic six, the queries to the sun god. Here we have topic three, the, um, the economic uh, text, the administrative uh, text over there. Um, we also see that there are a number of dots that sort of get into strange uh, places um, out of uh, the cluster of topic six uh, dots. Now, <coughs> a topic model is primarily useful for uh, doing exploratory research, for looking at a corpus of text where you do not really know uh, what is going on in that corpus of text. Now, that is not the case for the state archives of Assyria. Those have been studied for at least a hundred years. Uh, they've been studied very, very intensely and by some of the most big luminaries uh, of the field of essayology. So exploratory research is not really something that we want to do uh, with the state archives of Assyria. But maybe you want to teach state archives of Assyria. Um, and with your students, you will not possibly uh, read all 3,500 uh, texts. You will read a few texts uh, here or there. And you could tell your students uh, well, go to those two uh, visualizations uh, of the topic model uh, that I made and figure out what is going on. Um, how do these different topics uh, differ from each other? Uh, how are they related to each other? Why do we find uh, these dots that seem to end up at the wrong place? Uh, and so on and so on. Uh, in this visualization, you can actually select uh, a dot and click on it and that will take you uh, straight to the edition uh, of the text. Um, and that is sort of heartwarming to, uh, to cuneiformists uh, because they want to have an actual text and read that text rather than see uh, all of these accumulated uh, data uh, in one way or another. <coughs> One more example then of things that uh, we can potentially do with um, digitized cuneiform uh, data, and that is word embeddings. Um, a word embedding is essentially a collection of uh, vectors, uh, of high dimensional uh, vectors, where each vector uh, represents a single word, and the distance between those vectors uh, represents the semantic distance uh, between those words. Um, what you see here is um, a uh, word embedding model uh, that I built in uh, fast text. And um, I do here a search for the closest factors to the vector for Gesh Ada. Now, I believe that for some of you, your Sumerian may be a little rusty. Um, but I can tell you that this list of words that comes out of that search uh, all of these words have something to do with ships and shipbuilding. Now, if you look in the Sumerian dictionary, uh, you will see that Gesh Ada is translated uh, with something like log or plank. Um, from this, uh, we can say, we can actually be quite a bit more specific. Uh, Gesh Ada clearly means plank for shipbuilding. Now, that is a very common issue, actually, uh, in Sumerian semantics, uh, that we know sort of vaguely that a particular word uh, refers to a vessel, 
but we really have no idea what kind of vessel or for what kind of thing that vessel was used. So we know something about Sumerian semantics, but very often uh, we do not know a lot of nuance uh, of that uh, semantics. And so this uh, could be an approach that at least in some cases uh, could help add a little bit of that nuance. Now for me, a uh, core question uh, with all of this is, are my colleagues going to be interested in actually doing this? Are they going to invest their time in um, installing Anaconda, uh, learning how to uh, run a Jupyter notebook, uh, dealing with error messages, and so on and so on? The two people that you see uh, in, this, uh, in this slide are uh, Irving Finkel uh, from the British Museum in uh, London and Marta Roth uh, from the Oriental Institute uh, at Chicago, uh, two colleagues that I very much value and, um, and I have not put them up here uh, to say that they are Luddites or anything like that. Uh, they are certainly not. But would people like this uh, who like to read tablets, who like to open books uh, and uh, read them, who like to go through, um, through a card system uh, like that, will they be interested uh, in doing, in going over all of these, um, through all of these steps to actually use this kind of stuff? Now, in order to talk about that question, I will take you to still another sub-project. And that is what I've called sign search. So almost any sign in cuneiform has more than one reading, as we call it. So the first sign that you see on this slide is the sign su, uh, which can mean, which can be read su, and it means flash. Uh, it can also be read sug, and it means to replace. Or it can uh, be read kush, and then it means hide or leather. And the second sign uh, we call the sign chi, uh, that may be used for the verb chi, uh, to mix, or it may be used for uh, dup, uh, for ni, or for dug, which is uh, an adjective and means good, um, or it may even be used for a number, that is the number 3600. So say you are reading a tablet and you see uh, the sequence of the signs uh, su and chi, but what comes after that is a little unclear to you. Then what you want to do is go through the corpus and see are there any places where you get this particular sign sequence and then what kinds of words are formed with that. So in order to do that, I made a mashup of two rather different projects. That is OGSL, that is the Aura Global Sign List. OGSL gives you for every single cuneiform sign all of the possible readings. And the other project is uh, BDTNS, that is the database of Neo-Sumerian texts. I made a mashup of uh, those two, and I created a user interface uh, that you can see there. So you can enter uh, Suhi, and it will search for places where BDTNS has a sequence of those two signs in whatever reading. Now, when I show that to my colleagues, all of a sudden they want to install Anaconda. This is something that is very closely related to the actual workflow of what cuneiform scholars do. They take a tablet or they look at a photograph and they want to figure out what is going on uh, in this particular text. Part of it may be damaged or part of it may st simply for other reasons be uh, difficult to read. And so you want to use the signs that you can read to figure out what possible words uh, can we make out of this. And so you see here in the list of results uh, that yes, there, are, there is the word uh, kushdugana. Uh, kushdugana is uh, a leather bag, in particular the kind of bag that you use for um, carrying around uh, cuneiform tablets. So this is something that my colleagues certainly want to use and where they will invest uh, some energy in actually getting it to work. But here are also, this is also a place where some trouble may start. First of all, Pandas and TQDM, two of the uh, modules uh, that I use in, uh, in doing this, they do not like to work together very well. Um, 
what I get is um, a so-called future warning. Um, now, by this time, I know that a future warning may actually not be uh, so harmful and that I can sort of ignore it. But will my colleagues realize that the very first time that they open um, a Jupyter notebook and try to run it and they get a future warning um, in ugly pink? Um, I'm not so sure that they will be very happy uh, with that. There are ways around that, of course. Um, I, can, uh, I can catch uh, the error message and do away with it. Second, um, in order to use uh, the particular interface, the particular user interface uh, that I was showing uh, you, I need to install IPy widgets. Uh, that is sort of a, uh, a shorthand way uh, to make these interfaces. In order to use IPy widgets in uh, Jupyter Lab, I have to tell my users to run these three commands. You have to install Node.js. Now, I have no idea, frankly, what Node.js is. I only know that I need to install it. Right? Then I need to install IPy widgets. Well, that makes sense. I'm using IPy widgets, so I need to install it. And then I have to install the Jupyter Lab extension. And again, I do not know why I need to do that. So I have these three somewhat mysterious uh, commands that I have to execute and that I have to tell my users uh, to execute and I sort of fear that at every step here on the way at every one of these three steps I will lose a view of them <coughs> so these are a number of uh, rather minor uh, things that I think could actually uh, become quite important in trying to convince people uh, to use data science methods for uh, cuneiform uh, research Finally, then, I want to go back to this table. Um, and I want to go back. This is the table of the uh, seven most important uh, digital cuneiform uh, projects. And I want to draw your attention in particular to the last row of this uh, table. And that last row uh, asks the question, do they have open data in this project? Edsel has open data, yes. Uh, CDLI has open data, yes. ORAC has open data, yes. Archibab has no open data. That's because they're French. Um, SEAL has no open data. That's because they simply didn't have the technical ability uh, to do that. Um, the Ebla Digital Archive, not entirely clear to me whether they have open data or not. They don't say anything about it on their website. BDTNS, they have open data. Now, this, I can tell you, is revolutionary. Um, it is not very long ago that SEOologists would sit on their data and defend it with their life and not let anybody uh, touch their data until it was really in a final, final form and could be printed in a book. So this is really a very big change in the attitude of, uh, of SEOologists uh, towards their data. And I believe that one main influence uh, on the SEOological community um, has come from information technology, from the open source, open data uh, movement uh, in data science and whatever we call data science before it was data science. Um, so I think that uh, data scientists uh, may have had an influence on uh, the discipline of SEOG that they have never dreamed about. Thank you very much. <coughs> Questions?